This is the Green Era Network fake news for mid-February 2017, presenting an arbitrary mix of alternative facts, actual facts, satire, silliness, and serious opinion. I'm your host, Jim McGill. Coming up, the National Superior Firepower Association has announced a bold proposal. Attorney General Sessions knows how to reduce tensions between citizens and police. There's a border dispute in Idaho with an unlikely solution. We will have a religious news report by Jane But Ugly Beardsley. Finally, a critique of President Trump's executive orders and their possible implications. We'll be back with these stories in 140 seconds. It's 12.55. I got here at 9 o'clock. They told me I was on the machine for 59 minutes. More to follow. It's 10.47. I, my appointment today was for 8.10, so I've been here roughly two and a half hours at BioLife. And that included a screening and an extensive uh, health questionnaire and a mandated 15-minute uh, uh, wait period after I bled, and I bled for 59 minutes. My appointment was for 8.10. I got here early. Uh, started at 8. I was on the machine for 53 minutes. Uh, so all together, <clears throat> an hour and 25-ish minutes, including five minutes of waiting. Uh, at the end, it's supposed to be 15. I cheated a little. It has been nearly five years since 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was fatally shot by volunteer neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman. Martin's death and Zimmerman's subsequent acquittal for second-degree murder and manslaughter sparked the Black Lives Movement. Black Lives Matter has been raising concerns nationwide over the inordinate number of deaths of unarmed persons of color at the law hands of law enforcement officers. The most violent protests have occurred when these officers avoided meaningful punishment, which to many seems to be more the rule than the exception. To mark what would have been Martin's 22nd birthday, the National Superior Firepower Association has come up with a bold proposal that, they believe, would greatly alleviate this national plague. NSFA Vice President Hans Sanguin proposes that the resolution of the problem of police violence and racism is found in the Second Amendment. During an address last week to the NAACP, Sanguin said, The FBI has reported that between 2008 and 2012, 51.1% of Americans killed by police were black men. According to Huffington Post, 39 unarmed black persons were killed by police in America in 2016. On the other side of the coin, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund reported that 64 police officers were killed in firearm-related incidents in 2016. Now ask yourself this, how many of these police officers were one -armed, or were unarmed? As far as we can determine, probably none. Obviously, the solution to growing police violence perpetrated on unarmed black people is to arm them. The Second Amendment guarantees citizens the right to keep and bear arms. 
In order to protect themselves, the NSFA proposes that all black citizens who aren't otherwise disallowed by reason of felonies or other legalities should immediately arm themselves en masse. We will begin a lobbying campaign on this issue soon. When, when reached for comment via email, National Association of Trump Supporting Enforcers, Gus Tapos, reply was, Mein Gott, when Mein Fuhrer suggested back in August that Second Amendment people would know how to stop a President Clinton from picking judges, these are not the kind of gun-toting citizens he had in mind. In a related story, Recently confirmed U.S. Attorney General Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III has outlined a proposed Justice Department program designed to reduce tensions between police and the communities they serve. In a speech to the Southern Conference on Racial Purity, Sessions said, In a growing number of cities and rural communities across our country, citizens' impression of law officers as racist bullies who frequently violate laws without consequence has been growing during the past few years. This burgeoning perception has already reached crisis proportions. The roots of this problem should be obvious, he told solemn law and order supporters. Technology, specifically video cameras that are on millions of smartphones, so cheap that anyone can afford one. This ubiquitous technology, easily misused, is undermining the institution of law enforcement. Sessions continued, I'm not opposed to inexpensive video cameras as such. Obviously, security and traffic video cameras are useful to society, and that video can usually be secured by authorities before it gets into the hands of the public. I'm talking about civilians, even homeless people with their government-funded Obama phones, who are currently allowed to record inappropriate police behavior. An hour later, it ends up on Facebook. When the offenses are particularly egregious, these videos are all over the news 24 hours later. How can we expect the public to respect law enforcement when they are constantly bombarded with videos of police shooting suspects in the back who are walking away from them, ganging up and beating handcuffed prone minorities with batons, and continuing to taser subjects who have already been subdued? Sessions then went on to outline a, uh, outline a program that will reduce public access to what he called irresponsibility-prone technology to a nodding crowd, then mentioned future DOJ plans to cur curtail other factors that are disruptive to authority, such as freedoms of the press, assembly, and speech. Next week, Sessions is scheduled to address members of Christians for Trump, during which he will reportedly be discussing a proposed contract with the Iranian government to hold some of America's illegal aliens in their notorious Evan prison in Tehran. Evan has recently been the subject of n numerous news reports of torture, large-scale hangings, and other brutal deaths of the inmates housed there, including Western journalists who were arrested for taking photographs in front of the prison. C4T President Lowen Humble has already gone on record against the idea, saying, we would, respect, we would reject any plan that results in paying a Muslim government for anything, especially services we are perfectly able to provide on our own, in our own country. Private prison companies, which create jobs for Americans, have already earned reputations for squalid living conditions and brutality. They are gearing up to take in millions of illegals. We need to maintain, maintain these jobs in America. In domestic news, Don Drumpf of South Border, Idaho, has been complaining about his neighbor Diego Desesperado, specifically Desesperado's many children, for years. Says Drumpf, I have a quarter acre of backyard, most of which is vegetable garden. My wife and I put a lot of time into it, keeping the grass and landscaping looking nice, but mostly working the garden. I know it's too big for just Cindy and me. Even after giving veggies away to all our friends, we still end up throwing a lot of it away. But that doesn't mean that asshole next door can just let all his kids invite, invade my yard and eat our stuff. After we've I've pulled everything up. Sometimes I do that just to keep the little sons of bitches from getting it. They even dig through my trash for something to eat. Drumpf continued, 
Cindy's soft hearted. She says they come over here because they're impoverished and not getting enough to eat. That's probably true, but how is that my fault? She even claims they help her in the garden and with some of the chores around the house while I'm at work. Number one, I don't believe her. I know how lazy those people are, which is why they're poor in the first place. She obviously tells me stuff like that just to justify their behavior. Number two, and I've told her this, if it were true, they would be stealing us blind while she's not looking. Since nothing's missing, she's obviously BSing me. But I have a plan that's going to take care of it. There's a fence between our properties, but it's kind of old and not in very good condition. It obviously doesn't keep the little bastards out. I will be a, build a great, great wall on our border, and I'll make Diego pay for that wall. Mark my words. Trump's wife, Cindy, has some reservations about her husband's plan. She told our reporter, I don't know how Don thinks he can just build a wall, then get those poor, poor people next door to pay for it. That's just silly. Besides, I'm pretty sure a wall like Don's talking about would cost a bunch more to build than he's saying it would. We don't have that kind of money in our budget. Even if Don mortgaged our property to get a ban, there's no legal way he can expect a neighbor to pay for something we do on our own property. Reporter Jane Budugly Beardsley is standing by in Gallstown, Tennessee with a story that starts with a preacher but leads to a centuries-old misunderstanding surrounding clothing you might be wearing right now. Go ahead, Jane. Well, thank you, Jim. Simon P. Unctious, pastor of the Temple of an Angry Creator here in Gallstone, Tennessee, was del delivering one of his usual fire and brimstone sermons to his congregation last Sunday when his tie clasp came loose and fell to the floor. Consequently, as Pastor Unctious continued his animated exhortation while leaning over the pulpit, his flailing arms kept getting entangled in his tie. According to witnesses, this disagreeable situation continued for at least ten minutes before the frustrated unctious jerked the tie from off his neck, threw it to the ground, stomped on it, and declared, Tizer of the Devil. Unctious has often declared that every word spoken from his pulpit reflects the unquestionable will of God. So when I asked him about the incident afterward, he said, it's well established that neckties, along with cigars, rocket ships, and obelisks, are phallic symbols. While preaching, the Lord convicted me to my soul that I was essentially displaying a penis in church and that I should m remove that foul object from my person immediately. Next Sunday, after evening services, our congregation is going to hold a necktie burning ceremony and call upon our Creator to give us for our transgressions. When contacted for comment, the Prince of Darkness confirmed that he had, in fact, developed the necktie back in the 17th century. It was an experiment, he said. I wanted to confirm to myself with a few me that a few members of Adam's race were so ludicrous in their vanity that they might adorn themselves with any stupid thing at all, if they saw someone else wear it first. I never imagined it would catch on so universally. He went on to say that several times during the 19th century he had attempted to patent it, but indignant patent officer bureaucrats refused to accept his application for the, quote, decorative neck schlong, end quote. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, Jane. Finally, in our opinion segment, we turn to political and social commentator Jim McGill. Oh, that's me. It's time for America to face facts. We are being led by a president who is indifferent to scientific evidence, ignores policy specifics, admits that he doesn't read, and on February 1st referred to icon Frederick Douglass in the present tense. If you haven't reached ninth grade yet or graduated from a Pet Betsy DeVos supported Michigan charter school, it might be helpful to understand that Frederick Douglass died in 1895. In a Carnegie Mellon study comparing last year's Republican and Democratic presidential candidates in terms of their vocabulary and grammar, Trump scored a fifth grade level, the lowest of all the candidates. 
As we have learned following the executive order that gave Trump's chief strategist Stephen Bannon a seat on the National Security Council while removing the Director of National Intelligence and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the President apparently doesn't even read, or at least understand, the executive orders he's signing. As we have ascertained from several of his other executive orders, few departments within government who have ex expertise on the subjects the executive orders cover have been given opportunity to review them before he signs them. Legal expert Benjamin Wittes described the executive order on refugees as, quote, malevolence tempered by incompetence, end quote. The current administration uh, the current admission process for refugees generally begins with an application through the UN Refugee Agency, a U.S. Embassy, or specially trained non-governmental -govern organization. It includes an enhanced security screening by the State Department and Department of Homeland Security. If you wanted to commit violent acts in America, would you submit to a process that usually takes from 18 to 24 months just to get here? When that bastion of virtue, fully supported by the Christian right, Donald Trump, who publicly supports war crimes like torture, and on, in December 2015 said he would kill the families of terrorists, talks about extreme vetting, what do you suppose he has in mind? And who the hell is he to call someone else a terrorist? According to New America, a think tank that tracks terrorist activity, 94 people have been killed by jihadists in the U.S. since 9-11. The vast majority of those holy warrors were U.S. citizens or legal residents. None of them came from any of the seven countries that Trump's executive order targets for exclusion. Given the First Amendment and basic human decency, laws that respect the free exercise of religion are forbidden. Trump clearly proposed to ban inherits of Islam from the country and Rudy Giuliani has admitted that he was asked by Trump to help clean up the language of his executive order in order to make it appear like the ban had a legal basis. Every Republican supporter you've heard repeating the talking point that it isn't a Muslim ban is lying to you through his teeth. Bear in mind that America changed in a fundamental way as a result of the terrorist attacks in 2001. George W. Bush used 9-11 as an excuse to engage in unending war with two countries, one of which had nothing at all to do with those attacks. He also justified turning the U.S. into a surveillance state far beyond what citizens would have tolerated on September 10th. Benjamin Franklin said, those who would give up essentially lib essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. If you value what's left of your liberty, I'd like you to engage in a small thought experiment with me. Imagine a man who, time and time again, has displayed a complete lack of morality, saying things like, I moved on her, and I failed. I'll admit it. Whoa. I did try and fuck her. She was married. <laughs> and, and when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab him by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. Further imagine that in spite of... Great, but, but have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. Which most who self-identify as fundamentalist Christians say is a requirement for spiritual conversion somehow claims that this person is a Christian and fully supports his bid to lead the most powerful nation on the planet. Imagine that this man's statements are rated by PolitiFact and fully 83% of his public statements range from being only half true to what they call pants on fire lies. Further, envision that this man continuously says things that are contrary to the spirit and words of the constitution of that power powerful nation which he wants to lead. Conceptualize him surrounding himself with fellow racists, sexists, and Machiavellian demagogues who have openly called for holy war with Islam. Now imagine that, in spite of all these factors, this theoretical person achieves his goal of leadership. If this theoretical per president wanted to figure out a way to start that war with Islam, which, 
recent history suggests would grant him even more ego-feeding execu executive authority than previous leaders had, how might he foment Muslim jihad jihadists into the sort of violent m attacks that would, in the minds of sheeple citizens, justify such a war? Might he, oh, I don't know, start banning Muslims as religious class from coming into the country? My point is, a man can be clever even while he's a complete idiot. And that's the way it is. Not! May the forces of evil be unjustly accused of a crime, all their assets forfeited without due process, and spend years trying to recover what the cops have legally stolen from them, while meanwhile forgetting their plan to create the great national anxiety that citizens are finally waking up to, that they live in a nation governed by a populist would-be dictatorship. My name is Jim, and I live in a green era.